God has given his grace to each one of us, measured out by the gift that is given by Christ. That's why scripture says when he climbed up to the heights, he captured prisoners and he gave gifts to the people. What does the phrase he climbed up mean if it doesn't mean that he had first gone down into the lower regions of the earth? The one who went down is the same one who climbed up above all the heavens so that he might fill everything. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors, and some teachers. His purpose was to equip God's people for the work of serving and building up the body of Christ until we all reach the unity of faith and knowledge of God's Son. God's goal is for us to become mature adults, to be fully grown, measured by the standard of the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are supposed to be infants. I'm sorry, this is important. We aren't supposed to be infants any longer who can be tossed and blown around by every wind that comes from teaching with deceitful scheming and the tricks people play to deliberately mislead others. Instead, by speaking the truth with love, let's grow in every way into Christ, who is the head. The whole body grows from him as it is joined and held together by all the supporting ligaments. The body makes itself grow in that it builds itself up with love as each one does its part. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to pray with me. Dear Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight this day and always. We pray in Jesus' precious name as our Lord and Savior. Amen. So here we are at the end of the, the grace poster, and today we're on the E, which is entering into the fellowship of the church and entering into the reign of God and entering into the mission of God. So we'll take those each little by little. But if you were uh, at Bible study on Tuesday night, we looked a little bit closer at the reading that Mim gave us on 1 Corinthians. And we discovered that 1 Corinthians is a very different letter than the, the letter that Paul wrote in Ephesians, right? 1 Corinthians, that letter was written just dripping with sarcasm, and it's written to a church that was extremely divided. In fact, if, uh, I'd encourage you all to read some of it when you go home. If you want to do the Cliff Note version, you can just do it like this. Read your, uh, your chapter subtitles. Of course, you can't get to a page when you want to. But 1 Corinthians, Paul is addressing them. He's talking about rival groups within Corinth. He's talking about human wisdom versus the cross. He's talking about definition of wisdom, wisdom applied to divisions in the church. Um, Paul's role as an apostle, they were even fighting over Paul, uh, confronting sexual immorality in the church, avoiding sexual immorality, confronting lawsuits in the church, marriage and celibacy, uh, meat sacrifice to false gods. You know, you just, you're getting an idea of what Paul was trying to address here, right? He was, he was addressing a church that was very divided. And this is the early Christian church. And unfortunately today, as you've heard me mention in other sermons, there's 43,000 denominations in the United States alone. So our church is still very divided. But if we look even closer, we always run that risk as well. You know, we can never be complacent to the fact that we can be a church divided within our own congregation long before we even dare look at other ones. Now, I'm not suggesting that we're divided, but I am suggesting that we need to always be on the lookout because we start to harbor thoughts. We start to harbor, you know, things in our hearts. We start to harbor resentment. We start to harbor something somebody said in passing, you know. Next thing you know, it leads to division. Now, the book of Ephesians is a much different letter, and that's really quite upbeat because the church of Ephesus was doing very well. But Paul in the whole book of Ephesians was doing exactly what I just told you. You know, he was praising what they were doing well, but at the same time encouraging them and warning them to keep up the good work and be ever diligent to the fact that there are things that divide us. Now, 
the great strength, I've always said this, right? The great strength of the church is that we have people in it, right? Now, with a little vote of my own sarcasm, the great weakness of the church is that we have people in it, right? Now, why is that? Because when we come to church, we bring in our sinful natures. When we come to church, we bring in our secular influence. When we come to church, we bring in our dysfunction. And if anybody here thinks you don't have dysfunction, we've got to have a chat because we all have dysfunction. You know. What was happening in the church of Corinth and what, what Mim read before was there had been a hierarchy. What did Jesus work so hard, right? right? How many times did he bash the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders, right? All the time, right? All the time through the four Gospels, you heard Jesus knocking them, you know? And what had happened in the church of Corinth, the same thing. There had started a, a religious hierarchy within the church of Christ. And that does not, that's not compatible with the Gospels. The particular reading that Mim read was all about the Lord's Supper, communion. It's one of two sacraments that Jesus left us with. In the early church, they would celebrate communion by getting together and having a big feast and a big meal. And then, you know, they would celebrate the Lord's Supper as part of that. But it was much more than we just celebrate, you know, the, the two little aspects of it, the, the bread and the wine. But what would happen is the, the, the rich or the more affluent would bring abundances of food and and sit amongst themselves at their own table and just eat gluttonously and get drunk. And then there were people on the other side who didn't have any food, and they're sitting there watching them, right? This is in the Church of Christ. This is in the early church. So, you know, it, we could get frustrated that the church is so divided today, but it's also, you know, where we're coming from. So it's important for us to always be diligent about the divisions that are possible. So that's what Paul was specifically addressing in the, the portion that Mim read today. It was all about communion. But if you read that, that 1 Corinthians as you have time, you'll see that he was addressing a lot of things. And he was pretty upset. And he used his sarcasm to, uh, to convey his points to that. But I'll, I'll tell you, I'm gonna use, I always use myself. I never ask you people to go anywhere I'm not willing to go. Last year when I was at Course of Study, not this past May, but the first year I went, you know, you got to picture this. It's kind of a closed or cloistered environment. We're on a small college campus, and, you know, there's a hundred of us local pastors all there for the same purpose. We eat together. We stay in the same dorm rooms together. We have the same classes together. And you're living with the same people for two weeks. Now, anybody try and live with family for a week, right? T tell me there's not a small part of you that's like, ah, oh, when it's over, you know? Well, that first time I went, there were two people there in particular that were getting on my nerves. And by Thursday of the last week, I just, I couldn't take it anymore, you know? And I snapped at this one woman, her name was Ellie May, and I, of course, apologized, you know, profusely afterwards, but it just driven me to the point where she was driving me crazy through the whole two weeks. And I snapped, and, you know, sorry to say, I was not uh, very Christian at that moment, but I did apologize. And then there was this other guy, Roby, <laughs> who is just very loud and very upfront and, you know, just intense. And he was in all of my classes and always around me. And, you know, I couldn't take him by the end of the two weeks either. So this, this year when I went back, I always like to challenge myself. And I said, you know, I wasn't very loving to the two of them. And I said, I'm going to deliberately get to know them. And... You know, I got to know Ellie Mae, and she's um, a lady in her 60s or so. She has uh, raised five of her own kids. She's raised seven of foster kids. Um, all of them are serving God in some point or another. Three of them are pastors. Um, one of her sons, or son-in-law rather, was um, in course of study with us. And um, I found out that she's quite a remarkable lady. And I found that out because I took the time, instead of being annoyed by her, I took the time to st sit down and talk with her and say, hey, you know, what, what's up? And uh, she's one of my buddies now. So I, Ellie Mae no longer annoys me to no, no end. And the other guy, Roby, you know, the Lord had something totally different 
for, for Roby. Roby had actually failed one of the classes that I got an A plus in. And um, he came to me like right off the bat. He goes, you know, I need help with this class because he was taking it again. And he goes, I still don't really understand what the professor's asking me. So despite all the work I had, I read all seven of his papers. I commented on all seven of his papers. And I, I helped him guide him to where, I didn't give him any answers, but I helped guide him to what the professor was looking for in his papers. And you want to know something? Roby calls me once a month with prayer requests and, and vice versa. And he's praying for me. And you know what? He's my buddy now. So I took the two most annoying people I could find last year. And this year, I took the time to know who they were. And I discovered that they're pretty cool people. I discovered that they're pretty good examples of Christians, and I discovered that they're my brother and sister in Christ as well. So, and I'm using myself as an example, but I encourage you to do that in the church, not just here, but in our broader church, and, you know, and in your interaction with people from other denominations and other faiths. We have so much more that ever unites us than divides us, and there's a healthy respect in growing up, like Paul talks about us being infants in here, right? No longer be infants. But why does he say that? What does an infant want? You know, an infant wants his formula right now. An infant has to have his diaper change right now. A diaper, the infant wants out of bed right now. Everything is right now, right? We have to get to the point where we grow up a little bit as Christians. We have to get to the point where we realize that others come first. Right? You all know the Great Commission? Matthew 28, it's at the very end, Jesus is ascending, and he says to his 11 disciples, go and make disciples, right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the Son and in the Holy Ghost, right? Those are Jesus' last words on earth to his disciples. And what Paul is telling the churches is that you guys are now the disciples, right? We are are the disciples. We have to get over ourselves, stop being infants, stop being annoyed at somebody I'm living with that costs a study for two weeks, and understand their story. See God's call in their lives, because when I took the time to see God's call in their lives, it changed my opinion of them. And that was my sin. That wasn't their sin. You know, that was just me being an infant. I don't like you. I'm staying away from you. That's part of entering the reign of God. It's part of entering the reign of God. There's moments, John Wesley, you've heard me say this before, Christian perfection, right? You all remember that term? And that sounds pretty high and lofty. And, and John Wesley, when he was writing about all of that, caught a lot of criticism from his, his peers and the intellectuals and the theologians of the day. But what Wesley believed, and I, I wholeheartedly believe it, is that we were capable of brief moments in time where Christian perfection was in our lives, here and now, right? You know, I liken it to uh, a racquetball game. I used to play racquetball until my knee, my knee uh, said I couldn't anymore. And there is one shot where you hit it very low on the wall, and if you hit it just right, the ball will roll back. And your opponent cannot, you know, possibly hit the ball back. It's, it's unreturnable. And that is the perfect shot in racquetball. But you know, every now and then, and you've all experienced this, you may not have recognized it, but everyone in here has experienced this. You've had moments of Christian perfection. It's just moments when you're, you're aligned with Christ, when you know, maybe you're serving you know, somebody in a mission capacity. Maybe you are uh, you know, listening to somebody. Maybe you're just sitting with somebody who has Alzheimer's and holding their hand being the presence of Christ. But those are moments of Christian perfection. And the more that you practice, you know, like in racquetball, the more I would play and the more I would practice, the more times I would get lucky and get that perfect shot. But the more times that we practice our Christianity and the more times we love others and be delivered about our mission and be delivered about making disciples of Jesus Christ, the more times we're going to have those moments of Christian perfection, that perfect shot. And it doesn't, it's not to edify us, it's not to build us up, 
but it's to edify Christ. And that's what entering into community, entering into the reign of God is all about, and especially the mission of God. Now, I've had so many people talk to me over the last few weeks about all the garbage that's going on in the world. Israel's a mess, Syria's a mess, Russia's a mess, um, Ukraine is a mess, Africa is still a mess. So much war, so much strife, so much conflict. You know, you bring it on home and you can see that our country's a mess, our communities are a mess, our, our family nucleus is a mess, and you know, our lives itself is a mess. And there's this sense of hopelessness growing that's kind of alarming. And I felt it as well. It's hard to watch the news and not get discouraged. But folks, the church, the Christian church was born in times like these. The Christian church thrived in times 